Hey everybody, it's Dr. Carmen Bryant. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. I'm sorry, I know I haven't been here in a week or so. So believe it or not, during this corona uh, pandemic where a lot of people are in their homes uh, with nothing to do, my business actually is uh, very busy. And so I'm catching up on a lot of work uh, and I'm having the opportunity to talk to a lot of you who have made appointments with me and believe it or not, and I'll talk about it at the end of the video, some of you guys, well, some of you guys, all of you guys are like amazing people. You guys are very, very knowledgeable about this. And I think one of the things, you know, which is a blessing for me to be able to talk to you, forgive me, the dishwasher is running in the background, but a blessing is that you guys are really truly learning from these videos and you don't think you're learning, but I'm very honored because you guys have listened to these videos. And the proof is when I talk to you guys, you guys actually know what you're talking about. And I think you just need validation um, to help you and then and as a coach to kind of guide you into the direction that you need to go. But I just want you guys to know I'm so honored, um, you know, and I know that normally I try to try to not do long introductions, but I haven't talked to you guys in a while. So but, you know, but you guys are amazing people. I want you to know that, you know, many of you that are watching these videos, you guys are amazing people and you guys are so knowledgeable and you know what what's amazing is is that you don't realize how knowledgeable you really are so i'm really honored for those of you that follow me and then you actually give me feedback so that that right there lets me know is very productive so i've been busy and i apologize uh you know it's been hard to get on camera because i'm really really busy um, i'm working on some things you know so hopefully we come out of here we're gonna have some classes you know so i'm doing a lot uh but today i just wanted to come in so after that long introduction which some of you guys don't like i did it anyway but uh today i just want to talk about let's do part two of red flags so i had a conversation with someone today and uh, one of the things that i was saying is that you know when you have coaches uh and those of us that come on camera and we talk about narcissist abuse you have to remember these exact words that i use you have to remember that um you know when you are in a narcissistic relationship no one is slowing it down to point out uh what is happening in these videos when coaches come on and they're talking about um, narcissist abuse and they're giving you the details of what is happening really what is happening is, is everything is slowed down and we take a magnifying glass slow it down into a video and then we give you the details in slow motion once you come off the camera, you're going to hit play and you're just going to speed back up again. Life is going to speed back up. And so a lot of you are assuming that, you know, watching these videos, they're going to play it out exactly how you heard it on the video. Well, what happens is, is a lot of the red flags or a lot of things you experience with a narcissist that happens fast paced. We're just slowing it down to you to tell you what's happening. But you're knowledgeable now where you pick it up just as quick as they're putting it out. And you guys are really awesome. And so I wanted to talk about um, uh, calibration, which is, um, so it's two parts of the calibration. Calibration in the beginning part when it comes to the love bombing. When a narcissist is love bombing you and mirroring you, he or she is calibrating to you. The second calibration is when they are trauma bonding, they're calibrating you. They're not calibrating you to them. They're calibrating you to where they want you to be, meaning that they'll use false weights in order to calibrate you. So, and I'm going to talk about that. So in the military, uh, as you guys know, there's plenty of equipment and on a quarterly basis, most equipment has to be calibrated. For example, scales and, and stuff like that. They have um, scales within the motor pool. They have scales in the warehouses. They have scales like uh, whenever we do the, when we used to do uh, the quarterly, uh, every three months, you do a physical fitness exam. You know, you have the uh, physical fitness for record and you have the physical fitness just to see where you are at. So, you know, because every six months is the record APFT or the Army physical fitness test. It's called something different now. And every three, so it's six months is the record and every three months is to, to see where you are at. And so uh, after the physical fitness test, you go and do a weigh-in. And so those of you that have been in the military, you understand the weigh-in, you have to weigh, um, you, you have to weigh um, a certain, according to age and, and height, you have to weigh a certain amount. They tell you you have to weigh a certain amount. If you are over that weight, then they do measurements. They measure you to make sure that for your height and for your weight, for your height, that your measurements are in accordance to the regulation as to where you're supposed to be for your height, for your age. There you go, your height and your age. Well, on a quarterly basis, they have to come in and they have to calibrate the scales. And so what they do is they take a two pound, uh, two pound weight 
about this, I think it's a little pyramid. It's a two pound weight and they come in, the, the contractors may come in or usually contractors, contractors will come in and put that two pound weight on the scale. And then they look up at the scale to see if the scale lines up to two pounds, exactly two pounds. If it doesn't, they go to the back, they take the tool, most of you guys know, um, they take the tool in the back and they realign that weight. That's that good, we still did, we used to use the, not digital, we used to use the, the weight thing. And so what they do is if it doesn't line up with the two pounds, they go in and recalibrate it so that they can realign that weight at the top to line up with two pounds. The scale is now calibrated. So when a narcissist is actually love bombing you, so let's do it like this. Um, so when a narcissist is actually love bombing you, what they're doing is, so let's look at the definition of calibrate. Calibrate is uh, correlate the readings of an instrument you're the instrument with those no okay hold on let's go back correlate the readings of an instrument with those of a standard in order to check the instrument's accuracy okay so correlate the readings of an instrument they become an instrument remember they're trying to figure out what role to play in your life what character they're going to be they're trying to figure out by talking to you to figure out what role they need to play in your life to be that superhero to be that perfect person and so that what happens is is you have a standard there's a certain standard that you have there's a certain vocabulary a certain frequency you know a certain lifestyle that you have and so they need to get as much information as they can and they're calibrating to you they need to get as much information as they can in order to check their own accuracy to see whether they are lining up with you. So what they're doing in this mirroring stage is, is they're calibrating themselves to you. That's why many of you, you'll end up saying is like, when I met him or her, it's like, they're like the perfect listener. They're like the perfect, perfect person. They're just like, this is too good to be true. They, they just, they're so good at listening. You know, everyone that I've ever been with, you probably already said it and you don't realize how much you say because they listen to what you're saying in order to calibrate, to figure out what role they need to play. And so you're talking and I've never met someone that I, that I have so much in common with, or you're such a good listener. You can find yourself talking to these people for hours in a day. Your whole day goes by and you are just having this conversation with this individual where if you're talking to this individual, guess how much information you're putting out to this individual because they need to know how to align themselves to you so that you two look like soulmates, that you two look like. So the things that you're saying is like, I wish they, that this person would go back to the way that they were. They were such a great conversationist. They were, I mean, we have so much in common. You have a standard and you have a requirement that you want from your partner. Uh, whether you want the person to be educated, whether you want this person to be knowledgeable, whether, you know, and some of them may not have had the time to study you. So they take the opportunity of conversing with you and may, and some of them uh, may have great sense of humor, humor, they have great conversation and you find yourself drawn to them and you'll notice that they take a, a hours and hours to pull you in to seduce you remember there where you get that narcissistic stare not all narcissists you know in the beginning the narcissistic scare is not scary this narcissistic stare is seductive it's like seductive like you know oh she had the most beautiful eyes and he had i just i love the way that he talked and his mouth moved while he was talking he knows that you're watching him or she knows that you're watching her you know the way that they they talked and they have these beautiful teeth and you know and so they're they're aligning themselves up with you and they need to know your story they need to know your background they need to know what character they are playing in your life so really we're revisiting the mirroring stage but they need to know what character to play in your life you know you know my parents died when i was at a young age or you know i never knew my parents or you know i i'm, a, I'm an orphan or I've never experienced love before. And it's like every relationship that I've ever been in, you know, it always ended up like this and that and this and this. Well, basically what you're saying is, is I need you uh, to be able to understand that I feel abandoned. So I need you to be that person to make me feel whole. Um, I've never been loved. So I need you to be that person to make me feel loved. Um, you can say things like, I've never had a faithful, I need you to be the person that's faithful. I need, you know, I've never had someone that, you know, that is as intelligent as you are. I mean, you and I just have so much in common. Oh my God. Oh, and you like that too. And oh my gosh, you like that too. Oh, you know, and 
they may know basic information, but you're going to give out most of the information. Yeah, you know, because this band and this band and this band and, and this band it comes from this place and they play this and they play these. So you're given all the information. And if you notice, if you really pay attention, a lot of times they'll repeat what you're saying. So you think that they're coming up with new information. But when, when you look back at the conversation with them, you'll notice that you're the one that fed them the information. A lot of times they just regurgitated and gave it right back to you. So they're calibrating to you to find out what role they play on this chessboard. What piece are you on the chessboard and how do I um, conquer you? In this chess game, you know, you are an interesting individual and you have everything that I've ever wanted to be. You are everything that I ever wanted to be. And so I need to figure out how to be just like you. That's what the narcissist is thinking. You're everything that I ever wanted to be. You're everything. You're doing everything. And how how do you do this? Because now I need to copy you. I need to mirror you. I need to calibrate with you so I can figure out how how to be just like you. I need to be just like you. I need to be just like you. And the longer that they're with you, the more they begin to notice that you have flaws you know all of us have flaws all of us make mistakes all of us you know none of us are perfect and so in their mind they've idolized you and put you on this pedestal as being this perfect person and so in the beginning you'll notice that they're bragging to people and this is my boo you know this is my new man this is my 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 fiance this is my girl this is my woman you know or whatever language that you like because they're going to pick up on your language they'll even pick up on your accent you know so uh, or your culture they'll pick up they'll go study your culture just to bring your culture back to you you know if you're from from a uh from a, an exotic place or wherever you're at, you know, they'll go study it so that they can bring you information. And you're assuming there's a lot of information we can get on the internet, but you're assuming that this person really understands my culture. I can pick up a book and read as a therapist. I need to know a little bit about people's culture. So when I ask them what culture they are, I've studied certain things that give me an understanding how certain cultures look at relationships, how they look at child rearing, you know, who's the dominant figure in relationships. Um, I've had uh, different cultures come in and so I knew when we're doing couples counseling I knew to focus more on the headship which was the man and and to gain the man's trust in order to have a conversation um, there are other ones you know uh, uh, other uh, cultures where they, they you know they, each culture is different put it that way you know the, the the bottom line is each culture is different well if if a a counselor does that in order to to you know to merge in with the family to help the family you know kind to kind of work out their problems you, you become part of that family what makes you think that the narcissist is not able to do that it's a skill that we learn through practice and through education but a narcissist learns that skill through experience and you teach them so most of the stuff that they're telling you they're telling you of uh, they're giving you information about you and so for most people and i said this to someone just recently you know you 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 down yourself and you think that you're this horrible person i can't do anything for myself if i didn't have them and i didn't have them and but really they have mirrored you to a point where they gave you, you yourself back to you so you all the good qualities that you have they gave it back to you and you fell in love with yourself. Now, keep in mind, I said previously, just like my mentor said, is that in the very beginning, they don't know you. And so normally when they come to you, they come to you with the persona of the last supply because they don't really know how you are yet. And so when you first meet them, you're meeting the old supply or the supply that they're with. And as you're getting to know them, they're calibrating to you so that they look like you. So they act like you. So their hand, you know, and you're thinking, this is my soulmate. I mean, we have so much in common. Oh my God, we like the same music. We like this. And they don't like anything that you like. They're just trying to calibrate with you. And then you hate the, the old supply. And yet they brought the old supply to you and you really started liking the old supply. Then as they begin to calibrate to you, you started falling in love with your own self. And so for those of you that have a low self-esteem, you know or don't find anything valuable about yourself you they presented yourself to you you know they watched you and then they presented yourself to you so really you have a lot of good qualities and they wanted to know how to be you and so when they begin to calibrate and and be you they presented you to you and you like you so there's nothing wrong with you you know in in your mindset there is now let's talk about the second calibration 
The second calibration is during the trauma bonding, when when now they need control. And so in order to gain that control, um, remember, you know, the, the first calibration is to put the weight on the scale and to calibrate the scale to the weight. Now what they're doing is, it's just like, you know, the, the way, they don't think like this, but the way to, de to describe this second calibration is, let's say they put this, they're trying to um, see where you are at to see how how far they have molded you into what they want you to be. You know, you're not good enough. You don't do this. Why don't you ever do this? How come? So you, in your whole relationship, most of the things that you're doing is always to try to satisfy them. It takes two people to be in a relationship. Now I've said this several times, and I just said this several times today to several different people. Imagine being in a canoe a big wide one where you have you have no choice but to have two people to row it takes two people to row on both sides of this ship or this canoe or whatever the canoe's kind of narrow so you can kind of reach both of the pedals but let's say it was so wide that you have no choice like on those viking ships but you have to have people on the right and on the left so it takes both both parties let's say it's just two people it takes both parties to row this boat to make the boat go forward to get to the point to the goal right well if one person stops rowing what happens you're just going in a circle you're going in a circle and most of you guys got into the relationship and both of you guys were rowing the narcissist stopped rowing so you started rowing by yourself going in this circle and so you're trying to figure out you know what must i do to make this line back up and and we're not going to and so the narcissist lazy as they are is like the only reason why we didn't make it is because you didn't put enough effort and you're rowing with one arm and you look like popeye your arm looks as big as arnold schwarzenegger's leg and then you got this one little skinny arm on this side because you row so much and you're just rowing in a circle and all they never take responsibility and something as simple as is I stop rowing and I'm tired. Let's switch sides so that you can row with the with the arm that's not tired and I'll row with the arm that's that, that's not tired. You know, and so but they put all the responsibility on you of trying to make this relationship work. And most of you always say, you know, maybe if I would have been a better husband, or maybe if I would have been a better wife, or maybe if I would have cleaned more, or maybe if I would have done this and you know, I've worked so hard in a relationship, but everything just fell apart because they're lazy. They put all the responsibility of the relationship on you and you take all the responsibility as if there's not a second person inside of the relationship with you and so you guys have to stop taking the blame and you have to put the responsibility back on the narcissist uh, whomever that may be now the the calibration part though is let's say they put a two pound scale uh, a two pound weight on the scale and the scale is lined up at two pounds instead of leaving it there to prove to you, you know, you know that it's two pounds, but they'll take it back off and tell you that's the gaslighting part. And they'll take it back off and they'll make up a rule by saying, you don't leave the scale on there. You have to adjust, you know, you that's where the skill comes from. That's where the education comes from. You have to be able, it was just off an increment. And so you're supposed to, and, and you're like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. So they put the scale back on, put that weight back on there again, and it's off. And you're thinking, well, it's off, it's not at, it's not at two pounds. And they take it back off and they're like, no, no, you remember. So that means I need to readjust it. And they readjust it too far over. You know, and so you put that, they put the, the two pound on there. You're like, well, this is way off. No, because you don't know what you're doing. You know, if you just listen to me sometimes, you know, so let me take it off. And that's not how you do it. You have to use your skill and your education. You have to move it over. So they'll move it over to the other side. That right there is almost like a depiction. Well, it is. It is a depiction of the gaslighting, the crazy making. And you're starting to get confused and you start believing what they're saying in reference to the scale. So now all of a sudden you put a two pound, someone that it may be on the outside puts a two pound weight on here and tells you, okay, it says 150 pounds, but this is a two pound scale. You'll make up excuses based on what that narcissist said to you to, to validate or to justify why it is on 150 pounds and you let them know that you're crazy and that's not how it works and you have people a third person is like that is not how calibration works 
You put a two pound scale on there and you put it at two pounds, but you leave the weight on the scale while you recalibrate this scale. And because they have brainwashed you enough, you've been trauma bonded, you have Stockholm syndrome, you'll fight and argue that the information that they gave you is correct. While people on the outside of the relationship are looking at you like, have you lost your mind? What's wrong with you? Now, it gets to a point, though, this is that's that trauma bonding. That's that they, they've calibrated and they're not calibrating correctly. They're calibrating you the way that they want you to be. That is that trauma trauma bonding part, meaning that you'll get to a point where you're so confused, where where people provide you with information, but it's like that cognitive dissonance. You know, you're you're like, okay, well, I know it needs to be on here, but what he said is, and 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 now you're afraid to disagree with them, and you're afraid to be rejected, and and the emotional part it, it outweighs the logical part, and and in your mind you're struggling back and forth, and you have this fog in your mind where you're literally confused. Now that's a simple that's like a simple explanation and remember it's slow down we take a magnifying glass and we highlight and give you an example of what it's like just give you some examples but then when you come off camera and you hit the play and everything speeds up you know something simple like this it makes sense why you're saying it but when you see it then you can put the story together and like that makes perfect sense it does make perfect sense that's really what's happening during the time that they're trauma bonding and crazy making and and um not just trauma bonding but um but um uh gaslighting you they're making you feel something as simple as two plus two is four we learned that what in first grade kindergarten you know two you put one plus one is two look you know it's two you know but by the time that they're through talking to you you're like no -uh. one one plus one is not two one plus one is three it's logical because the way that he or she explained it to me and people are looking at you like whoa you know you are truly dysfunctional because you have been brainwashed they have calibrated you and in the trauma bonding phase they have calibrated you to their dysfunctional thinking and it's so abnormal and dysfunctional that sometimes people on the outside just can't understand why you think the way that you think then later on when you come out of it it really feels like you're about to go crazy you're about to lose your mind i don't understand this and really what has happened is it's just you've been brainwashed You've been trauma bonded. You've got Stockholm syndrome. And a lot of you that have come out of the relationship can look back now and it makes sense to you like, how did I fall for this? Well, if you're with the same person over and over again and they won't allow you to talk to other people or they always make sure you're isolated and their whole goal is to make sure that you and they sound a lot of them, you'd be surprised. Some of them are like the smartest, dumbest people you'll ever meet. It's like you're like, wow, you are so intelligently dumb i've never met someone as educated and stupid as you are you know i mean I'm, I'm being funny but but some of you can look back and like this is like the most intelligent brightest dummy i've ever met in my life but most people don't catch it you catch it because you are in a private place with this individual and a lot of them are covert narcissists where they may be good in the field that they're in engineers they're good with mathematics you know um they can tell you a whole lot about mathematics they know a whole lot about everything and know nothing you know they may specialize in the area of law they may specialize in engineering they may specialize you know they may have their specialty but they're so arrogant that their assumption is, is if i'm smart in this i know everything you know but when you actually that with that if that's why i tell you guys the no contact and the longer you are no contact the more that fog starts lifting off of your mind the more your mind starts clearing up the more you start thinking clearly and really one day you have this epiphany this aha moment where you're like oh my god like i said this is like the most intelligent smartest brightest idiot of i've never i've ever never met in my life and some of you guys how did i fall for this and then you even look at the way that you were thinking you know when things start to clear up and you get a real mentor that really points out you know and won't let you get away with uh garbage you know won't let you get away with anything he's going to point out the pink elephant in the room you know and and the embarrassing part for most of you that i've talked to and most of you that have made comments is that i can't believe that the education that I have, the job that I hold, the position that I have, what I'm entrusted with. I can't believe I fell for something like this. I can't believe that I was so blind. I'm, And most people always say I'm so embarrassed. 
I am so humiliated. I am so, I, I don't even want to show my face. Well, this is a different type of relationship. This is a diff different type of person. You've never been with a person like this before. Most people have never encountered anything like this before. Uh, do all narcissists physically abuse a person? No. Do all narcissists cheat? No. What about the religious narcissists, the ones that have to maintain a, a certain persona in front of their congregation, you know, in front of their congregation, the congregants, you know, there's a certain reputation that they have to maintain. So cheating is not one of the things they're going to do because they have a certain persona and a certain reputation they have to keep. But there are some that do cheat, you know, and those that are in a pulpit, they do cheat, you know, but not, you know, you have to remember that a narcissist, you know, these are individual people of different cultures, of different languages, of different genders, you know, of different other um, uh, mental issues or emotional issues, but they all have the same symptomology of narcissistic personality disorder. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, I just don't understand why my, you know, what, what role does alcoholism play in narcissism? Mm, some of them are alcoholics, some of them are drug addicts, some of them are not. If you take narcissism away, if you look at a person as a meth addict, you know, what commonalities does he have with a person that doesn't have alcoholism? You know, maybe they have depression, maybe they have post-traumatic stress disorder. If you have a person that is um, a drug or alcohol um, addicted to uh, addict, you know, nine times out of 10, there's probably some trauma that has taken place in their life. You know, so most people point out this one particular thing, you know, uh, uh, my narcissist cheated. My narcissist was a porn addict. My narcissist smoked cigarettes. My narcissist was a drug addict. My narcissist was a pedophile. My narcissist was, first of all, they're not your narcissist. Stop saying my narcissist and taking, taking, it's like taking luggage. That is not your luggage. Let go of that and change your language. That is not your narcissist. That is the individual that you were with that had narcissism. So take, disconnect yourself, change your language. Uh, like my mentor said, change your confession. You know, that is not your narcissist. And the more you say it, the more you keep on, the more you're taking possession of that individual and you won't let them go. And you wonder why when you're talking to people, you're still connected to this narcissist. You have to let them go too. There are certain things you have to do mentally to disconnect yourself from that narcissist. Stop calling them my, they're not yours. They're probably community property. They're not yours. You know, no one belongs to anybody. Even if you're married, you don't belong to someone. You're married and there's a contract and there's an agreement that you two have, but you are not a personal possession, nor are they your personal possession. And so you have to change certain languages that you have concerning that narcissist. But I did want to come in and just talk about some red flags. Those are some red flags, um, you know, in the beginning, in the early part of the uh, relationship when you're meeting someone if, and then moving too fast, you know, because when you feel comfortable, they that's what they do, they slowly cause you to trust them to put down your guard. And so you are operating out of emotion. Don't operate out of emotion. In the military, we don't operate out of emotion. We operate out of training and logic. You may have emotions, uh, you know, you have personal emotions or we be robots, you know, you do. And, you know, me as a uh, former first sergeant, I had to make a lot of decisions that really broke my heart, you know, to have to put out somebody from the military who is dependent, him and his family or her and her family are dependent on military finances to support young babies, young children. And you know that if you leave them in there, you know, there's a possibility you go to war and they're going to get the whole company killed because they don't know how to follow orders. They don't know how to follow instructions. You try whatever you can to try to help them out, but they don't want to help themselves and assume that you won't do anything and can't do anything. And to have to make a decision where you have the power to end somebody's career and put them out of the military. You have the power to end someone's career and put them out of the military and take their money and their livelihood away from them. That can cause a family to break up and not to be able to eat. You know, there are some people that are cruel that don't mind doing it because they enjoy the power that they have. And then there are some of us that really are hurting because we know we have to do it. 
you know, and you can't fall on your emotions. You have to weigh the options. What more can I do to help this individual? If I've done everything that I can to help and this person doesn't want help, then I'm going to have to put you out and you're going to have to find another career. And those were decisions that many of us had to make in the military. But if we were over emotional and I left that individual in, I knew for a fact that our unit was deploying. And had I allowed the unit to deploy, even af after I retired, you know, had I allowed that unit to deploy and that person was still in the unit and would have gotten majority of the, the leaders and the soldiers killed because of their rebellion and because of the fact that they refused to follow instructions, regardless whether people knew or not, I would have known that I had the opportunity to save other people from this one person. Uh, there would have been other people that would have known I should have put them out, but that I would have taken full responsibility of the fact that I could have saved a whole unit by discarding one person and putting that person out of the military, which I had to do, you know, and so think about it to use logic. A lot of you guys have to use your wisdom, your logic, your training and put your emotions to the side, because when you make emotional decisions, your heart will drive you into the wrong direction. Your heart, which is full of emotions and, and feelings, you know, this it's normal to have feelings and emotions. You're supposed to. But when you're making major life decisions, you can't go by your emotions and feelings. It's just like in the military when we used to talk about buying cars. You got young soldiers that come in and they see this nice car with rims and, 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 and you know, they get it and they finance this car. <laughs> At, 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 you know, you hopefully you get like six, what is it? Two or three percent, six percent, you know, financing APR, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, and these kids are buying these fancy cars with rims and everything. And they're at like 70 percent finance fees, you know. And so their car note on a car that may have cost them three, three thousand dollars to buy this car. They're paying eight hundred dollars a month. And after get they get through paying for the car for five years, they paid a hundred thousand dollars for a three thousand dollar car that probably lasted them for a few months and they had all sorts of issues now see that's not logical but they're so uh, affected by what they see and they're emotionally they're emotional and i'm gonna look like this and i can you know and i'm gonna look cool and i'm gonna but and and no one uses common sense like you know what let me just get me a little hoop or give me a little car that i can afford at this particular time let me get my bills out of the way let me stack my little money like they say in the military let me stack my little money and put my money aside so i can buy me a car cash that i really would like a brand new car that doesn't you know you see what I mean? So you guys have to make logical, wise, informed decisions when it comes to relationships. Because nowadays, I mean, narcissism is on the rise and you don't know who you're talking to. Nowadays, it's hard to trust anybody. And so you have to be wise. If you got that gut instinct, if you got that, mm, go with that feeling. Go with your first impression. Like something's not right. I don't know what it is. Something, you know, I don't feel comfortable or just something, you know, because normally when they keep you in that conversation for a long, long, long time, you start thinking about them. You start that. That's the purpose to get you thinking about them and get you thinking about them and get you thinking about them. And then you notice you're always on the phone. And when you're not on the phone with them, you can't even focus because your mind is set on thinking, what are they doing? Should I call them? Should I text them? You'll put aside all your work and everything just to have a conversation with a person. At one point, you used to be a busy person. Now your time is over consumed talking to this individual. That's what you need to pay attention to. Because if they can take you out of your purpose, if they can take you out of your timeline, if they can slow you down in your business, that is not the person you want to talk to. The person that you want to talk to or the person that you may be interested in will help, you know, argument or add to, you know, or they may have certain dreams. But you'll see progress. You'll see evidence of their progress, not blame. And they start something and they never finish. They talk about these big ideas, but they never finish these big ideas and hold you accountable for not being able to complete these ideas. So just wanted to give you guys some red flags. Thank you so much for being so patient with me. And like I said at the beginning, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of you. And you guys are some amazing people by watching these videos. A lot of you have really, you know, you just need, you know, and it's nice because uh, some of you may have done a consultation with me once or maybe twice. Um, and you guys are doing great. You just need someone to affirm, you know, and validate you know, that you do have the knowledge and you're on the right track and to give you a little advice and then put you on the right track and you guys are doing great. So don't underestimate how much knowledge you have on these videos. You know, you just have to make certain decisions and certain decisions, meaning that you have to cut these people off. 
you know, like I said, don't just jump up and do stuff without getting informed, getting legal advice, especially those of you that are married and have children, um, you know, because, you know, there are laws that protect the parents, narcissists or not. Can't go in a courtroom calling somebody a narcissist. You have to stick to the domestic violence verbiage. Find yourself a good domestic violence advocate. You know, um, you'd be surprised. They have pro bono. They have legal lawyers and, and legal representative that will assist you with getting out of these situations. You know, and I just said it to someone else. That's why it's good to use these agencies because they will assist you in getting out the relationship, getting a no contact order, help you with child support, help you with parenting plan, help you with protection orders. You know, you have to utilize it, but you can't go in there calling them narcissist and narcissist abuse. You have to say what it is, domestic violence and psychological abuse. That's the language that you're using because everyone is really not aware yet of the effects of a person that has narcissism. And then the question becomes, is how do you know that they have narcissism? Because most people are accusing people of being narcissists and they're not. They're just arrogant. They may have borderline, something else going on, but they're not narcissists. You know, everybody is not a narcissist. It's just the fact that you're getting knowledge about it. So it seems like everybody, your cat, your dog, your fish, you know, everybody's the guinea pig, my guinea pig. Everybody's a narcissist. Everybody, ha, 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 you know. So, but thank you guys so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe to my channel. It is Dr. Carmen Bryant, Overcoming Narcissist Abuse. And I also have two Facebook pages. It is Overcoming Narcissist Abuse. And then I have Psychological Health Consultants and Services. And so usually when I come on live, I come on live on the psychological health, but I'm trying to get enough people to revert over to Overcoming Narcissist Abuse so I can just use that page instead because that's my book page. Um, if you have not gotten my book yet, you can go to Barnes and Noble. You can go to Amazon. Um, and those of you that are uh, out of the country, you can go to West Bow Press. Here he goes, is West Bow Press. And those that are out of the country, they will send to you out of country. I think Barnes and Noble and Amazon wouldn't send out of the country the book, uh, but West Bow Press will send you the book. And this West Bow Press, if you are out of country, they will, I don't know if this is backwards on your screen, but it's West Bow Press and they will send it out of country to you. So I had, you know, some of my subscribers, my beautiful family in the Philippines. And so they couldn't get it to, to send, the Amazon wouldn't send it over there. Barnes and Noble wouldn't send it over there, but uh, Westbow uh, Press did send it over there across the waters. And it is Unmasking the Illusion of Perfection. True story about real people that have been through narcissist abuse, people that were in high positions, people that were um, groomed by their own um, parents, uh, family members, and it, and they really were groomed and, and kind of handed over. You know, they became narc magnets because of the fact that they came out of a foundation and a family of uh, narcissists. You know, and so they gravitated toward it and they gravitated toward it, to, uh, gravitated toward them because of the fact that was a part of their, um, you know, upbringing. And so that is their norm. That's all they know until they recognize it. You know, what did the kids go through? You know, what kind of abuse did these children suffer being in a, uh, uh, relationship? You know, the, the parents being in a relationship with a narcissist, what kind of abuse did these kids suffer? You know, what is the after? What were the thoughts? What homicidal and suicidal thoughts that were running? through their mind, you know, what did it take to escape? You know, what was the feelings of having to come out? What were some of the thoughts, the embarrassment of, of being a high, you know, uh, uh, in a high position and then all of a sudden being, you know, reflecting and thinking, how did I get into this? You know, I'm embarrassed to even be around this person, you know, uh, some of the things that were said. So these are real stories about real people that have been through narcissist abuse. And many of you guys, now you guys know that, um, uh, I'm a believer. I know that everyone is not. And so when I wrote the book, I provided encouragement, biblical encouragement. Um, I told many people that if you're not a believer, take the principles out of it because you will find yourself in this book. And then the encouragement that I provided, I, I provided encouragement through biblical means. But it does address narcissism and the abuse, you know. And so a lot of you said, you know, I'm not even a Christian, but I got, you know, I felt so validated after I read that because I felt like something was wrong with me and I was crazy. And they finished. It's a short, it's an easy read. You know, I don't know how many pages that, how many pages that. So it is an easy read. It's like 102 pages, you know, 102 pages to read. Uh, and so, and it was, most people say I read it in one night, you know, so it's a very, it's a, it's a good book. It is a very good book. I wrote it, but it's, it's, I even, I was interested. I went back and read my own book, you know, um, but it's a good book. You know, it's an easy read. Yes, you can give it to the teenagers. You'd be surprised that a lot of these teenagers are going through this already, 
And they, you know, once you educate them ahead of time, you know, a lot of time preventive measures, you know, to, to provide them with preventive measures and education, a lot of them, you know, and young people absorb very quickly and they're very, very cognizant. They're very, you know, observant. And so they'll pick up on things quicker than we'll pick up on things, even with you. You know, so yes, you can give it to your teenagers and let them read these books. You'd be surprised how many good advocates you have as teens, you know, young people. Uh, I have young people that come on my channel that are, that, that listen to me and my mentor and make sure you subscribe to my mentors page it is helen sadler destiny helper um, and subscribe and share these videos with people you never know who's going to get these videos and who you're helping you know i was surprised at the people that i was helping i didn't even know that they were in the crisis that they were in and a video popped up and i'm talking about their situation right then at the present time you know and many of you have come out of these situations have been following me and i thank you thank you Thank you. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Also, for those of you that have asked about donations, I do have a cash app and a PayPal right up underneath the link. Those of you that are looking for counseling, I cannot provide counseling outside of the state of Washington. I cannot go across state lines for counseling. Many of you guys, I put the information out there. You guys send me an email and ask me the exact same question. I cannot provide counseling outside of the state of Washington, and I do not accept insurances to do coaching. Um, but I do coaching outside of the um, state of Washington. Many of the YouTubers and, and subscribers that are outside the country, outside of the state. And the difference between counseling and coaching is with counseling, I focus on your mental health, your post traumatic, you know, if you have post traumatic stress, uh, recommendations for um, med providers and, and, you know, and symptom management, you know, I focus on that. And, uh, you know, uh, so I actually one on one counseling where I'm able to look at the person, do assessments and, and treatments and provide them with tools in order to manage mental health problems. With coaching, on the other hand, I listen to what's going on and I need to know what your plan is. You know, what is it that you're trying to do? Are you trying to get out of the relationship? Are you trying to hide? Are you trying to, you know, uh, uh, relocate? Are you, what are you doing? And so, you know, what is your desire? So how do you, do, you don't know how to get to that goal. You don't know how to get away. So what we do, what I do is I set up some plans with you. I give you some resources. I give you some plans. I give you encouragement so that you can make it through the court system, give you some encouragement and connect you with some resources you probably didn't know was available. You know, give you some phone numbers to call, you know, so I help you I coach you through this process and a lot of you have been through the process and you're like oh my gosh you know everything that you said was right on point pretty much it is right on point you know I, I hope I know what I'm talking about you know I wouldn't waste all my time you know talking but I hope I know what I'm talking about been there done that you know so a lot of you guys find it very effective so if you want coaching please email me my email address is underneath there underneath I think it's underneath the link too uh it is Dr. Carmen Bryant at Outlook.com, D-R-C-A-R-M-E-N-B-R-Y-A-N-T at Outlook.com. And so please email me. Um, now, remember, some of you guys are still emailing me long books. It's very hard for me to read all those emails because the longer your email is, the more you're asking for a consultation. So when you write long emails and at the end of it, you say, you know, you know, can you give me some advice? Well, it costs to get some advice. It costs to, you know, people are paying the price to get consultation and good advice, you know, and I find it very valuable information. If I had the information, I probably could have, you know, gone way beyond where I was at. But when you write long emails, those are called consultations. You're asking for advice and you're asking for information, you know, to assist you. That's consultation. That, that costs, you know, I'm a paid, I am a, um, I am a, pay for service provider, you know, and so at the coaching and counseling. And so, you know, when you write those long emails, a lot of times I can't read through all that because I have clients every day back to back to back. And so, and I'm listening to stories all day long. I'm having to focus. And so when I open up my email, you have these long stories. I don't have time to read a book at the time. So I know some of you guys are like, I can't believe you said that. Yeah, some of those are books, you know, so, uh, and then as soon as I said it, I think about five of you guys sent me some long books right after, after the live video. I said, what the, were you guys listening to me? So I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you guys allowing me to be myself. And I really have fun with you guys. I miss you guys. I'll talk to you guys on Sunday. I'll be back on live. This is a long video, but I haven't been here all week. So I kind of figured you probably need a long video. I want you guys to stay safe during this coronavirus, um, you know, pandemic. Find something to do as much as possible. Stay at home. Um, I do have to go out and go to my mailbox. I have to go and, you know, uh, now I'm doing different deposits with my money. I'm, I'm doing a lot of, um, you know, uh, a lot of transactions 
that are online, but I still have to go out and check my mail. I have to go to the post office. Sometimes I have to run to the store and stuff. So I do go out there, but I'm a believer. I cover myself, you know, and I try to distance myself as much as I can and get in and get out as quickly as I can. Uh, but you can find, you, you'll find out you have a lot of talents. You know, I told you guys I was going to buy a fish tank, just made a fish stand. So I'm over here being a carpenter. So you guys, if I can do it, you guys can do it. And so you guys stay safe. Okay. Stay safe, stay healthy. Some of you guys were asking about vitamins, um, zinc, um, vitamin C, um, go look up camu camu powder. Camu, camu powder, C-A-M-U, C-A-M-U is a Brazilian camu fruit from uh, the Amazons. Yeah, from the Amazons, but it's 10 times more potent than the orange. It's 10 times more vitamin C and it's camu, camu powder. You know, you can put it in your drinks, in your smoothies. Um, so zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, multivitamins, fish oil, um, elderberry, if you can find some elderberry, um, uh, what is it? Elderberry uh, concoctions. So like some elderberry um, liquid. Uh, you have to look up the elderberry. Elderberry is real good. Garlic, turmeric, turmeric. Um, what else? Uh, you get vinegar, you know, apple cider vinegar. You know, you do whatever you have to do to stay healthy. You know, make sure in the mornings and during the day, um, you know, get some some water with some lemon and lime and some ginger and maybe some honey and make sure you're drinking something hot during the day. You know, drink something hot to clear your throat out. You know, if and you know, this is allergy season and then the seasons are changing. So when the season changes, people catch like those uh, those seasonal changes, cold or those allergies. So your throat is itching. That doesn't mean you have the corona. You might have allergies. So make sure you're drinking something hot, you know, and during the day, drink water that's like at room temperature to clear your throat out and everything. You know, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm just telling you what I was told. So you guys stay safe, okay? You guys can tell I'm getting sleepy. Yep, time to go. So I've been on 45 minutes. So, but I miss you guys. I love you guys. My love to you. Stay safe. Uh, stay Corona free uh, and stay in the house. Stay your butt home. Sit down somewhere. Wash your hands and take a shower. Don't take a bath. Take a shower. Wash your hands. Wash your hands up to here. And then after that, wash your body, you know, with some soap and water. Wash your clothes, clean your house. You know, this is the perfect time to do your spring spring cleaning. You know, clean out some stuff, you know, sanitize your stuff. You know, find something to do. You guys take care of yourself, and I'm going to talk to you guys on Sunday. You guys have a good night, and go be great.